Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have, I'm honored to have, I used to listen to him to and from in the car on tape cassette way back when, Dr. John Demartini. He founded the Demartini Institute in 1982. He's the leading authority on human development. He's been featured on Larry King Live, Oprah Magazine, in the movie The Secret. He shared the stage with Stephen Covey, Wayne Dyer, Deepak Chopra, Donald Trump, Richard Branson, and many more. He's author of 40 books. He's produced over 60 CDs and DVD programs, the latest with Apple founder Steve Wozniak. And if that wasn't enough, he travels 360 days a year all over the globe sharing his research and findings. Dr. Demartini, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm excited to hear your big lessons, mistakes you learned in your journey, what worked, what didn't work. Um, I always like to include a fun fact about someone. And a fun fact about you is you have a tendency to eat two grapes at the end of dinner. Why is that? You know, I'm not a sweet eater. I don't ever, ever eat sweets. And I, but I love a couple grapes or a little fruit at the end of a meal to uh, just change the palate. And people always laugh at that. They, they go, can I have my two grapes? Uh, and um, people think it's kind of odd because they say, well, uh, can I get a bowl of grapes? I just want two. I don't okay. want a bowl. I just want two. And uh, so I usually get that. And uh, that's a quirk that I have that people always get a kick out of. I want to dig deep about where you came from, some of your inspiration, where you get that from early on. But first, tell people, you were telling me right when we, before we started about the world. Tell people what the world is. Well, um, I, I, one of my homes is a, is a ship called the world. It's a private, luxury, um, large condominium ship with a series of us that own it collectively. And that has beautiful condominiums on it. And it circumnavigates all over the world. It just nonstop travels around the world. I get on and off it as I travel and I speak. So I've been living on there for about 13 years now. Wow. And um, I, I can't think of a better place to live. I've said since I was in my 20s that the universe is my playground, the world is my home, every country is a room and house, and every city is a platform I can share my heart and soul. So when I came across this the ship, I went, well, it's the world. Every country is a room in the house. So for, so for people who don't know, where are you today? I mean, you travel all over the world. Where are you right now? Right now, I'm at the Michelangelo Hotel in Johannesburg, sent in Johannesburg, uh, South Africa. Nice. And nice. so let's go way back. Before we get into the, you know, where you built up the success of the Martini Institute, what was your childhood like and what did you have to, have to overcome then? Well, I had a bit of a challenge initially. I, I was born with my hand and foot turned in. And I had to wear braces up until I was age four to help straighten those out. Then I had, um, in first grade, I found out that I had dyslexia, learning problems, speech impediments. And I was told by my first grade teacher I would never be able to read or write or communicate, never mount a thing, never go very far in life. And uh, I made it through elementary school with the help of the smartest kids by asking questions. But then my parents moved from Houston, Texas to Richmond, Texas, where I lived in a small town with kind of a low socioeconomic area. It didn't have a whole lot of smart kids, had nobody to ask. I started failing, so I ended up dropping out of school when I was about, about 14 years old. And um, kind of hung out on the streets and uh, eventually picked up surfing as my, my love. And I um, ended up hitchhiking to California and Mexico and many How places. How old were you then when, when you did that? I, I was 14 when I hitchhiked first time oh, to California wow. and through Mexico. <clears throat> and then I uh, hung out on the beaches of California and a few places and eventually made it my way to Hawaii right at 15. And um, then hang out in Hawaii until I was just 18 years old. So I had uh, hung out as a long-haired hippie surfer guy uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. And um, then I almost died when I was 17 uh, from strychnine poisoning. And uh, that is where big changes occur in my life, right, up, right after that experience. I, luckily, a woman found me in the tent where I was living, <clears throat> and my, chain, my life changed big time that day. So who was the woman, and what did she tell you? Well, she found me in my tent. I was isolated in a tent in the jungle, and uh, she heard me, I guess, making noise in the tent because I was pretty sick. And um, she came and just helped me clean up the tent and helped me recover, and 
took me to a little health food store, and from that health food store I saw a little flyer on the door, and it said special guest speaker Paul C. Bragg, Sunset Recreation Hall, North Shore of Oahu, and something intuitively say go go listen to this guy, go find out what this guy's about. And I never went to classes. I dropped out of school. I didn't attend classes. Didn't read or anything. And uh, but I went there one night and I listened to this one man for one hour that one night share one message, and that was the night that I saw. Uh, the possibility of me learning how to read and maybe becoming intelligent someday. I didn't believe I could be intelligent till that night. And then that night I, I had a dream to be a teacher and uh, travel the world and share whatever I learned with as many people as I possibly could and do what this man did for me that night and try to inspire people to live amazing lives. So here I am 42 years later and I can't wait to get them to do that. I'm just as inspired today as I was then. So. There's a big gap between that point and today. What did you do next after hearing that message? Because, I mean, if you picture that, you're, you know, living in a tent at that point. Yeah, I was a kind of a long-haired hippie guy living in a tent. And uh, first, I ended up uh, staying in Hawaii for a short period of time, surfing still. And then when the springtime came, the surf started going down. Um, I ended up uh, flying back. I ended up having to fly back to, to L.A. and hitchhike back to Texas. And my parents parents, uh, when I got back, they encouraged me to take a GED, a high school equivalency test, because I didn't have a high school degree. And uh, I couldn't read, but I, I still hadn't read, um, and so I just guessed. I just guessed, and I passed. I'm not sure how the heck that happened, but it was just part of my destiny. And then I took a college entrance exam and guessed, and I passed. Somehow I made it. And then I took my first college class, which was a history class, and I... Um, tried my best, but I absolutely failed. I got a 27 instead of a 72. You had to have 72 to pass. I guess my dyslexia had the number right. back. I got a 27, and I almost, uh, I was devastated. I remember driving home crying. I had to pull off on the side of the highway three times because I was crying so much. I got home and I curled up in a fetal position underneath this Bible stand in this sunken living room at my parents' house. And man, I had a low moment. I just couldn't see light at the end of the tunnel, and I just thought, I'll never do this. This was a big joke. I thought that I could be intelligent. And then my mom came home and she saw me there laying on the floor and, and she said, son, what happened? She had not seen me crying in a long time. And she said, uh, what happened? I said, well, mom, I blew the test. I guess I'll never read or write or communicate, never mount a thing, never go very far in life. I'm really sorry, but I, I just don't think I can do it. And she didn't know what to say. And finally, she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, son, whether you become a great uh, teacher healer, philosopher, and travel the world like you dream, or whether you return to Hawaii and ride big waves on the North Shore like you've done, or return to the streets and panhandle as a bum, I just want to let you know that your father and I are going to love you no matter what, boy. Hmm. And when she said that, um, that was a really touching moment. It was like my heart just opened. My hand went into a fist, and I felt loved and appreciated. And I saw my vision that I saw when I met Paul Bragg that night. I saw a vision of me speaking in front of a huge audience. And um, I said to myself, I'm going to master this thing called reading. I'm going to master this thing called teaching and studying. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to travel whatever distance. I'm going to pay whatever price to give my service of love across this planet. I'm not going to let any human being on the face of the earth stop me from my mission. And I got up and I hugged my mom. And I, I'm not even myself. No, I'm not even going to stop myself. I hugged my mom. I got in my room. I, I got a dictionary out, and I made a commitment to memorize 30 words a day and increase my vocabulary 30 words a day until I could learn to read. <clears throat> and I had to pronounce the words. My mom used to test me on 30 words a day. I pronounced the words, described what they meant, um, used it in some sort of sentence, and kept pronouncing it and memorizing 30 words. And then I had to go back and add another 30 words on top of it and review them all. And I just kept re uh, adding to my words until I was able to pass school. And then uh, I had more of a, you have no idea how much of a thirst I had to learn to read. It was like everything. So I just started reading, and I just read and read and read. I started reading encyclopedias, dictionaries. And my mom came to me a few months later that fall, and she said, son, what do you want for your birthday, for, for Thanksgiving and Christmas? Because I was born on Thanksgiving Day. I said, I want the greatest teachings on the face of the earth, the greatest writings that humanity has ever created from around the world. She said, son... You sure you don't want a shirt or something? Like a bike? <laughs> I, said, I said, Mom, I want the greatest teachings on the face of the planet. 
So she said, well, let me see what I can do. So she contacted her brother, who was a professor at MIT, uh, former physicist and chemist, and as a gift, uh, this guy sent to our house on a flatbed truck two six by six by six foot wooden crates of nothing but books. Whoa. And uh, they unloaded them on our front, and I got a crowbar and opened them up and brought them into my room and filled my entire room with books, except for a little space to do yoga and meditation. And uh, I started just out absolutely devouring every book in that, that I got. And it was on every imaginable ology, discipline, philosophy, mathematics, sciences, religions, anthropology, archaeology. It didn't matter what it was. Mythologies. Anything to do with it that I would want to learn. Because I just want to know the laws of the universe. I just want to know what made human beings tick and how, what's our place in this universe. And so I, I devoured that. And I lived literally fasting and, and doing nothing but reading is 18 to 20 hours a day. And uh, I still have a neurotic... Uh, love for reading. I do it every day. There's probably 15 books right here in front of me. Um, and I, I constantly read and I, I, I started teaching. I, I started gathering students around me. They started coming to me. And you know, I started out with one student, then two, then three, and then 17. Then I had about 150 by the time I got to college. They used to gather around under the trees and listen. And I just kept growing from there until now I've been blessed to go all over the world teaching. So you've obviously read tons and tons of books. You're telling me just even if you're walking to and from the bathroom, you're reading 10 pages of a book. What are some of your top books that for philosophy or business that people need? It's a must read. People need it to check out. Well, it's not just specifically on business. <coughs> it's about life. But um, there's a two-volume set by Britannica. It's part of the great books, the great idea series. Uh, and it's called Syntopican Volumes 1 and 2. And it is the greatest ideas by the greatest minds of the Western world over the last 2,600 years. And it's basically, it's, it's a, the two beautiful compendiums, great pieces of work. <coughs> I highly recommend those two uh, because I think that a person who really grasps everything in that is in a much better, greater position to master their life. And I think that mastering business is also about self-governance and mastery of oneself. So tell me, how did you get from there and first started in business? Well, my first business, believe it or not, I was nine. I, I, uh, my dad, I went to my dad when I was nine years old and said, Dad, I want to make some money. I want to earn some money. <clears throat> he said, well, if you mow the yard, yeah. If you edge the yard, yeah. You mowed the, you clean up the sidewalk, yeah. You trimmed everything, yeah. You did the bushes, yeah. You cleaned the gutters, yeah. Clean the garage, yeah. You done my shoes and shined them, yeah. Son, I have nothing else uh, that I need done. So if you want to make some money, you're gonna have to go to the neighbors. So I started going door to door and asking what I could do, and within a short period of time, I found uh, people that wanted my service, and I started selling uh, mowing and edging and hedge clipping and you name it. And I started charging five to nine dollars or twenty-five dollars for hedge clipping and things, back in 1963. And uh, so those are good prices. And but but what I did is I started doing. It, I started making money. So I started buy, buying baseballs and gloves and bats and things, all the sports equipment that I wanted because I wasn't an academic then. And my dad saw me with all this stuff. He said, "Where'd you get all this stuff, son?" I said, "I did what you said. I started working." He said, "Well, what did you do?" I said, "I mowed an edge." He said, "Well, where did you get the equipment to do that with?" And I said, "Well, I used it out of the garage." He said, son, i got to teach you something here. When you borrow equipment from people, you got to pay a depreciation cost and a rental cost. He's a tough I, crowd. I said, so what does that mean? And he calculated everything I had done. He says, you owe me money. And so I had to do the next two yards to pay him off. And then uh, I had to do it, and I was making less money because I had to pay him. Because I was using up his gas. He made me pay for gas, everything. When I made less money, I was working harder and making less, which some people I know what feels like. And uh, then one day I was uh, mowing, and this little kid came up on a bicycle, and uh, I thought, you know, I could get this kid to push this mower. And so I got this kid to, uh, I said, if I pay you 50 cents, will you push this mower around the yard? And he thought, wow, that's great. And the 50 cents in those days was substantial. So <clears throat> I got three kids uh, doing that yard, and, and within about, a, about three or four weeks, I had three groups of three kids doing yards with me, and I started borrowing other neighbors' uh, equipment. 
And I ended up, after all payment, all the kids, uh, my dad, everything else, I netted $45 on some days uh, back in 1963, which would be about 600 bucks today. And that's pretty good for a nine-year-old. Very good for so a nine-year-old, yeah. I had a little entrepreneurial spirit. And see, my dad believed that because I wasn't going to make it in school and I had learning problems, that he thought he might as well be street smart and figure out how to do it. And he actually wanted me to think longer term, so he got me a coin collection set and uh, to make me save coins long term and a piggy bank that he never gave me the combination of the key to. And I have in my desk drawer in my office in Houston, 50 years later, that same coin collection bank, oh, wow. the piggy bank, I've never been able to open it. It's got, <laughs> it's got these incredible coins in it from all these years, from all those years back then. And someday I'll open that, I guess. Yeah. But it was a reminder to think long term. That's Not a great. Term. That's a great story. What did John, Dr. Demartini? What did the early days of the Demartini Institute look like? Well, the first beginning of it was um, me having a vision. I was studying the Vedic text, the Eastern mystical Vedic text. I had um, a guy named uh, Goswami Tamal Goswami Gurudeva gave me 72 volumes of Vedic texts um, and I was just devouring comparative religious studies at the time. I was studying every religion, 3,000 different religions around the world and I, every time I could get the actual texts, original writings, I tried to get them. <clears throat> and I was devouring them one night and about 2 in the morning I was taking a break and I did this meditation uh, and I got a vision that I was going to start this thing called the Concourse of Wisdom which was a, a curriculum of classes that I wanted to share for my research. And that was the beginning of the Institute. It was originally called the Concourse of Wisdom, but that was the beginning of what I was doing. And I ended up getting 27 of the brightest people I could find in Houston, Texas. Theologians, physicists, artists, uh, uh, doctors, all different types of specialists. And I had my first class of 27 students. And I did a presentation on the evolution uh, of human consciousness, basically, from the micro to the macro. And I started doing these classes, and the people started dropping out, and I didn't have anybody in the classes after three classes. It was too heavy, too deep. That's, that and sounds really deep. It was too deep, and it wasn't practical. And so um, I kind of went, okay, I guess that's not the structure. And I went back, and I opened up my practice and started practicing, and I, I w just put my focus on researching and practicing yeah. every day and building my business. And then a few years later... Uh, up came the realization that I could do the Breakthrough Experience, which is the program I've done now for 26, 25, 6 years now. And uh, then all of a sudden, my other series of programs, I have 72 courses that I teach, all of them surfaced one by one, and I was able to revamp all the information and keep updating it and then present that. And that became the concourse inside of the Demartini Institute now. You, so, you found that early on, that stuff was too heavy, it was too deep. What did you, what was the first course program you hit on that you're like, you nailed it. This is what people want. Well, um, well, I got to speak, as you know, in, in, uh, back in 1983, <clears throat> I started speaking at the Parker seminars. Yeah. And for people uh, that don't know what that is. That's uh, a large convention for chiropractic health professionals to learn how to more effectively serve people uh, and grow their businesses and grow their, their service. And uh, I was able to, because I had a successful practice, I got to speak on that. And I'm still speaking on it 30-something years later, 31 years later. But um, so that was a, a launch to some degree. That worked. Yeah. Yeah. And that led me to have all kind of other opportunities. And I started doing presentations in business, in entrepreneurship, <clears throat> and uh, in the health area particularly. And slowly but surely, that spilled over into other businesses. So people said, well, can you... You know, other business first dentistry and optometry and medical yeah. and all these other people, and then other industries, and it just kept growing. Now, I get to work with all kinds of companies from Fortune 500 to you name it. Because you had a very successful practice, what can you tell people? What were the things that you did you think that helped the most during those times when you were focused on um, serving patients and in your practice? Well, I had to. Um, <clears throat> I learned after reading a book called The Time Trap by Alec McKinsey uh, how important it was to stick to priorities and delegate lower priority things because Parkinson's law stated that if I don't fill my day with things that inspire me of highest priority it will fill up with low priority distractions that will lower my self-worth. Yeah. 
And so I basically went through there and I made a list of everything I did in a day, and I uh, prioritized it according to what produced the most meaning, the most inspiration, the most profit. Um, and then I put next to it the cost of replacing somebody to do it if I needed somebody to do it. And then how much time was spent. And when I put all those parameters, I was able to discern uh, what was really the most important thing for me to do with my skills and my talent. And once I saw that, um, it gradually changed. I started hiring people to delegate things. So I started hand handling one more off and off and off and off. And I slowly but surely moved in practice from doing everything to gradually mainly adjusting and doing exams and, and reports and, and consultations to eventually uh, doing only very specific clients and speaking and enrolling people into, as patients. So I was going out and doing talks in the morning, lunch and dinners and generating patients and I ended up having five doctors working for me to just take care of all the patients. I was generating them, they would take care of them and I was working with just the top patients that I wanted, celebrities and people like that. So um, I kept prioritizing, delegating and learning how to overcome my fear of letting go of stuff and uh, hiring people more efficiently that were more congruent and more skilled than I was to help them do that. So it was a slow, steady process. It took a few years to get it more mastered, but that helped my practice grow, and uh, and I still use that today. Yeah, and obviously, you know, having the capacity to hire five people to do the work, what did you find worked as far as getting clients? Because you had that knack, it sounded like. Well, uh, public speaking is one of the most powerful, and I <clears throat> started my own radio show. I had my own TV show. I started doing talks, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and um, so I was sometimes doing three talks in a day. If I had a talk, if I did a breakfast talk in front of 60 people, I, I basically shared stories from people in my practice that their lives change, and I would end up with at least five to eight new patients. I, I knew how to generate patients, so each patient in those days was worth about three thousand dollars. So well, if I could do, you know, fifteen to twenty thousand dollar morning uh, going in and, and, and stimulating patients. Uh, that was the most efficient thing I could do. My practice, even adjusting, I couldn't generate that. So I got the five doctors and I had 12 staff members and I basically went in there and just generated patients. So we had lots of new patients. I think. Yeah, You've always had that, I guess, gift for teaching <laughs> and that translates into the Demartini method. For people, what is the Demartini method for people who aren't familiar with it? Well, it's a tool with a thousand uses now. I, I'm using it all over the world in all different industries, almost every area of life. Um, it's being used in business and in financial areas. In business, it's used for conflict resolution. It's using for intimidation in sales. It's using for uh, communication between departments. But what it is is basically a, a series of questions uh, to help you find the hidden order in daily chaos and to help you dissolve emotional baggage that's in the way and turn whatever you're perceiving on the way. So we will work it in business. I work it in financial institutions and, and brokerage companies on dealing with grief and loss with mon if the markets go up and down. Um, we do it in, <clears throat> in health care for health purposes. We've got people all over health care doing it uh, to dissolve stress. We've got it in relationships on communication and conflict resolution. Um, I, in fact, I just got asked to work on a, to do a program coming up with United Nations people and prime ministers on conflict resolution. It's going to be used there. Um, <clears throat> it's used in, in your health, as I said. It's used in uh, social causes and leadership. In fact, there's a gentleman that's about to run for U.S. president. It's utilizing it to dissolve the stresses of daily activities going on in the management of politics. I mean, all over the world we're using it. It's got many applications, and um, it's very inspiring to see it grow and reach out to the world. Yeah, and obviously you test all these things on yourself first. What's an example when you uh, applied it to your life? Well, it was a slow, steady process. The, the method has been evolving uh, from two questions, then four questions, to six questions, now 48 questions. And it's basically concise questions that help you see things you don't normally see with your awareness. For instance, if somebody's criticizing you and it's upsetting you, you immediately ask, <clears throat> so where and when do I do that in my life and have I done that in my life? And I have to answer that question until I see I've done it as much as I see in them. So you basically dissolve some of this self-righteous behavior and judgment of them. And then you have to ask the question, so how is it serving me? Because it's never what happens to you, it's how you perceive it. And you have to be accountable for your perceptions. So how is it serving you? <clears throat> and you basically go in there and you have to find enough benefits until you're grateful. So that's, yeah. that's, two, two, that's, that's the first three questions. What exactly is it bothering me? 
where do I do it, and how does it serve me? So there's a series of questions, 48 in all, that by the time you're done, there's nothing there in the way. You're just grateful, you feel love, and you get on with what's priority, and you don't have fear mm -hmm. and shame and guilt and all the emotions that keep people play, playing small. Yeah, so if someone's doing something to you, you ask yourself first, when do I actually do that to other people? And that and will, you, will dissolve I, it. I, I went through the Oxford Dictionary, I'm neurotic, you know. I went through the Oxford Dictionary, and I went through, and that's that big one, with thin paper. And I went through there, and I circled every trait that a human being can have, and then I went through, alphabetically, and I thought, who do I know has the most extreme example of that trait? I put their initials out, and then I asked, where and when do I do that trait until I own it as much as the most extreme example I could find? And I found out that I had all 4,628 traits I found in the dictionary in my life. Nothing was missing. And that meant that no matter what anybody said about me, it was true. I was kind and cruel and nice and mean and stingy and generous and honest and dishonest. I was everything at different times, different places. And when I did, I realized that the things that push my buttons that people do or say around right. me, it's only right. because I wasn't owning those traits. If they say something and I own the traits, it has no impact on me. So that was very freeing to know how to own everything and realize nothing's missing in me. So what was something so, that used to push your buttons but now, because you use this method, doesn't? Well, back in the, I think it was in the early 80s, I was still into the positive thinking uh, mentality where I was looking to be, you know, always, always be nice, never mean, always kind, never cruel, always support, never challenge, always look for positive, never negative, all that stuff. And I realized, I did a, stu uh, a study on myself, another one, and I uh, basically monitored on a daily basis uh, my fluctuations and emotions and how I felt in all seven areas of life spiritual, mental, career, financial, family, social, and physical while affirming 600 affirmations a day on the most positive words out of the English language with those words subliminally engaged in it embedded in it and I basically did everything I could to try to find out whether or not saying positive things all day long is going to make that much difference and after two years of doing that, 24 months, monitoring this on a chart, I found out that I was having ups and downs, but the net was still the balance. So I realized I'm not here to talk about only positive. I'm here to talk about balance. You can't have a balanced physiology without a balanced mind. So I'm not interested anymore after age 29, after I finished that, in going for a one-sided world. I understand you have to embrace both sides of life, have realistic expectations with both sides, appreciate both sides, and love both sides of yourself. Because if you're trying to get rid of half of yourself, you never love yourself. There's nothing to get rid of in you. Everything is needed. No matter what you've done or not done, you're worthy of love. So what do you tell people who, um, I guess, on your thoughts on positive thinking, then? What do you, what do you uh, tell them? Well, I would say that as long as you're addicted to one side, you're going to get slammed by the other side to break you through. Uh, I always say that anything to support your values makes you juvenile dependent. And anything to challenge your values makes you precociously independent. You need both support and challenge, both positive and negative, to have magnetism in your magnet of life. So you, 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 I'm not here for one-sidedness. It's a, it's a futile attempt to try to get a one-sided life. You better, it's wiser to embrace both sides of life than it is to search for a one-sided monopole. Because I always say a bipolar condition is a byproduct of monopolar addiction. The addiction to one side splits you apart and makes you not love yourself because you're trying to get rid of half of you and all the other people around you. Love people for who they are. They have both sides. When you communicate in their values, they're nice. When you communicate in people's, uh, uh, challenge people's values, they're not so nice. Life is going to have both. Prepare, appreciate, serve yourself with both, and realize that you're a human being. And that's kind of what, the, what you're saying the Martini method does. When you have those negative thoughts or someone's pushing your buttons, you kind of ask those questions to say, well, I probably do those same things. And uh, so you don't take not it as personally. It's not probably. It is. I've gone through a quarter of a million people and demonstrated that everything they've ever seen in somebody else, they got. And even when they start, they go, oh, no way, I don't do that. I would never do that. Oh, I pride myself in not doing that. A hundred percent of the cases in the Breakthrough Experience, the program I teach this, um, they find it. And it's very humbling and it's very revealing. But it also works in the other way. You take the most powerful, admired people on the planet that you look up to, the biggest, most powerful business leaders, financial leaders, social political leaders. If you look at their traits, you also have those. And if you basically acknowledge and find out where you have them to the same degree, it gives yourself permission to play in a new field of possibility on a much bigger scale. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, people, you were also featured in the movie The Secret. And some people absolutely love The Secret. Some people are skeptical. What are some of the misconceptions 
about the movie The Secret? Well, there were many of us that were in the movie, and I, I can say that very few of the people in the movie would agree with everything in the movie, because that's, that's the fabrication of a woman that produced it. And uh, it's, I'm grateful for that because it reached a lot of people, millions of people, and i able to reach more people myself because of it. But there were many things that I think were missing that were edited out, uh, like take action <clears throat> and realize that life has two sides and don't think you're going to be a one-sided person all the time. In fact, I can state with certainty that everybody in there has both sides. I know them all. And so to live in a fantasy of a one-sided world, I would say depression is a comparison of your current reality to a fantasy you're addicted to. So if you get addicted to fantasies and unrealistic expectations, you're going to end up depressed and frustrated with nightmares. So my, my advice is to get real and set real goals in real time that are authentically congruent with your highest values that you really are inspired by, that you won't give up on, that you will endure pain and pleasure in the pursuit of. If you do, you'll achieve the most. So there wasn't enough talk in the actual movie. You think about, you know, you have these thoughts and feelings, but you need to actually take action and set these steps to do them. Yeah, well, what's interesting is the people in it, they all act. They're all working, you know, lots of hours, putting the energy into it. So my, my feeling is take action. Action, uh, you know, I don't know of anybody that's a billionaire that hasn't uh, worked their ass off. <laughs> right. And, you know, people see you. They see, oh, he cruises around a ship. I mean, it's hard work to, to go to all these countries, all these cities and do these talks. But then they see, oh, you know, Dr. Demartini, he just cruises around on a ship. What are some of the, you know, they didn't see what it took to get there. What were some of the big mistakes and big lessons learned that along the way in, in your business career? Well, you know, I, I don't see, I don't, I don't use the word mistakes. As I always say, def define a mistake as uh, whenever you expect to live in somebody else's values and you judge your own actions according to somebody else's values, you're going to label yourself a mistake. I don't use that term necessarily. I just use everything as a feedback to help you refine and polish and master your life. Right. But, but <clears throat> uh, there are many things that I, um, I could say. I think I even put some of those down here. If I can look back here, I made a list because I, I had a sense you were going to ask some of those. <laughs> but uh, let me just say this. Uh, trying to be somebody you're not is probably the biggest illusion. And envying, you know, Emerson said, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. Trying to be somebody or not is, is the fastest way to set goals and aren't yours uh, without the values that it takes to achieve it, where you end up with the ABCDs of negativity. You'll end up beating yourself up with anger and aggression, blame, betrayal, criticism, challenge, and despair and depression because you're not being yourself. The most magnificent you'll ever be is you, and no fantasy about you will ever beat the real you. So get clear about what your real values are. That's why my newest book, The Values Factor, I put so much emphasis on that. Get clear about what your highest values are, what you're truly dedicated to, what you're inspired by, and prioritize your life around what's meaningful and what serves people the most. And you're on your way. But if you try to be somebody you're not and presume self-righteousness of what the market needs instead of finding out what it actually needs, and also uh, if you assume that you're supposed to do something that's not inspiring to you because it, you should do it or because somebody said that's what you should do, uh, living in imperative language like shoulds and ought tos is not going to be empowering. You have to live in a life where it's inspiring that you love to do, that is something that's meaningful that you can't wait to get up in the morning and do. Yeah. So I basically say not being yourself is the, probably the biggest delusion that I attempted to do when I was in my 20s, early 20s, and found that this just doesn't work. So be myself. Another one was sucking up to people you think have something you don't. I did that and when I first got into practice. I thought, oh, I want to surround myself with celebrities that might be important. Well, I found that they were a pain in the butt, so I'm working with them. And so I basically said, I'm not working with them until they come to me as a celebrity. And I turned that around and I started owning the traits and realized now that's what's happened. So now they come under my terms instead of me sucking up to them in their terms. You're not here to minimize and put people on, on pedestals or put people in pits. You're here to put them in hearts with equanimity of your own mind and equity between you and others. You said in your 20s, you weren't, there was a point where you weren't yourself or you're imitating others. What, what were you imitating? What were, was it some, a mentor? Were you modeling something in particular? Because I think everyone can relate to that and they start somewhere. Well, yeah, I, I mean, there was a whole bunch of people in the health professions uh, that I tried to be like uh, in, in the early stages. And I thought I should be more like them because they're successful. But then I realized uh, they're successful. They have a different set of values. And if I'm trying to be in their values, I'm defeating myself. And I couldn't, I didn't have the discipline and reliability and focus on those things that aren't really important to me. 
So I had to find out who I was, and um, when I did, I just got got back on the focus because I was subordinating to some authorities in our own field, and I realized that that's not the answer. The answer is to be unique. That's what makes it. See, when one's living by their highest values, because their hierarchy of values is unique, um, they give themselves permission to be unique, and that's where they make the greatest difference. But when they're trying to be somebody else, they're they're in competition with other people instead of being unique. Mm -hmm. You can't make and you, you're not an unborrowed visionary unless you're authentic from your own your own values. So, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, I'd rather have the whole world against me than my own soul. And when you're going out, and you know, when, when someone's teaching, and you have the Demartini method, and you travel all over, you know, obviously we hit up against some roadblocks and challenges. What are some of those roadblocks that you've hit up against when traveling the world? Well, occasionally I get uh, you know flights canceled. Uh, Hotels somehow double book. I don't see uh, that getting you down though. What, what's something? No, no, no. What's I, I, if I have to get a freaking private jet, I just get a private jet. Or if I get a hotel, I just call and say, well, then let's get the suite, or let's do this, or I, I do an Eddie Murphy in the lo in the in the front front of the lobby, you know, but uh, like 24 hours. But I find a way, and there's always a solution. If I have to go to another place, I do it. But I find a solution. And now I have contingency plans in place because, you know, I've done this so long. I have people that take care of that because all I do today is research, write, travel, teach. Everything else is delegated off my plate. I don't do anything else but that. So I'm researching, writing, traveling, teaching. So I have people now that tell, help me in research, have people, help, people, help me in writing, help me in uh, doing, uh, setting up all the gigs and hosts and stuff so I can do what I do best and mm -hmm. stick to the most priorities. But I, I have challenges uh, sometimes with those two things. Uh, getting it all done. I have some incredible deadlines sometimes, but there's just a, a lot going on. Yeah. And uh, I, I take I oh, I try to push myself to the to the limits. Otherwise, you don't get to find out what you're capable of. So I have incredible schedules. I mean, I've done 21 uh, interviews in a day before, wow. and uh, wow. plus a talk. And I mean, I I, I, I keep a very intense schedule because I I find out if I don't fill my day with high priority things, it fills up with weeds. So I just I fill it up, and so I have publicists and and directors and people and that fill up my schedule and hand me a schedule. I get my schedule every day, there it is, and uh, they tell me where I'm going, what I'm doing, what's next on the agenda, and it's full throughout the day. And I keep that weeks in advance. So what's the hardest part about what you do? The hardest part <clears throat> uh, is probably dealing with sometimes the challenges of learning how to more effectively communicate in people's values so I get my message across. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes that's a tough one because everyone is comes from all over the place and they have different values. Well, the the key is it forces me to have to be with my heart open. It forces me to be authentic because if I do, every human being wants to be drawn. They're drawn to people who are authentic. Mm -hmm. So if I'm authentic and I'm basically self governed and I'm in my heart, um, then people are drawn and I can communicate most effectively. So it's it's a feedback to force me to make sure that I'm me. So I I always say that everything that's going on in your life. Physiologically, psychologically, economically, uh, vocationally, relationship, it's all feedback to make you the true you. Have you found to be a certain crowd to be the toughest, like to get through on the, that kind of values as you were saying? Well, you know, I, I was asked to speak, I'm, I'm going back in January to Tehran, I was asked uh, to go and speak in Tehran. and. Um, we had to get special sanctions to know, well, they had sanctions against Tehran at the time. This is last February, a year ago. And um, we had to get special visas and special, you know, systems in order to get out of the U.S. because the U.S. wasn't allowing people to go in. And they, I went there and I spoke to 200 uh, political leaders um, and 400 of the top corporate leaders. And I had a day called a Day of Mastery. We had a 90-minute module on self-mastery, business mastery, financial mastery, and leadership mastery. And when I first walked out on that stage, I, I swore I was sitting in every mafia on the planet in front of me. And it was a real solemn looking group. By the end of the day, I had them. They were, we had a blast. It was unbelievable. But walking out on that stage was a tough one. And I had um, bodyguards, three bodyguards, and they, they, because there was a religious fraction that was uh, picketing around the outside and had a charge and wanted to, to battle me in television, I was surrounded with 600 personal it's uh, what he calls secret service people around to make sure that they didn't come in and try to give me a problem. And it was a very uh, tense time when I walked in that room, but that was, that was a challenge. That group was challenging. And the second probably the hardest challenging is sometimes five-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the, the most, those are the two most extremes. When I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get my deep message across to the five-year-olds, and I got to simplify it. That's a tougher crowd, right? Yeah. What did you do in that moment? Because you walk and you see the solemn looks. What did you do to get them? Kind of, uh, I don't say on your side, but kind of with you in, in your message. I told him a story that brought me a tear in the eye. The very first student I ever had when I was 18 years old was at Wharton Junior College, where I, where I first failed those tests. And when I went back, I had my first student come up to me. I was sitting outside in the sun meditating. And this Persian guy from Tehran came to me and asked if I could teach him meditation. And so in the process of doing that, um, I told him the story that my first student that I ever got to teach was from your country, Iran. And the Tehranian was my first student, so I want to first thank you because I'm finally back in your country. And I start, my whole career started teaching when I met a man from your country. And that opened up the door and started to warm them up. And they applauded. And then I basically quoted something from the Quran, a, a quote that had an inspiration to it. And, um, and when I did, it, that lightened it up some more. And then I said, listen, my job is not to just talk to you and talk from the stage. My job, we're, we're working together on mastering our lives in all areas. So I'd like to share what I've found from studying and traveling, etc. And before the, you know, before the hour was out, it's already warming up. But by the end, it was just the most amazing uh, day. It truly inspired. It went on till 3 in the morning. I, I was still interacting with the president and the head of the Secret Service at 3 a.m. It was insane. And we had to start back in the morning at 7, so it was a very intense day, but it was absolutely rewarding. What made you, Dr. Martini? what made you think that was so important to do that? Because obviously you're a busy guy. You have to go through all this red tape with the visas and the Secret Service. Why was doing it there so important to you? Because I made a commitment when I was 17 to uh, step foot in every country on the face of the earth. And so that's another country. Got it. Got it. What was, and you know, obviously, um, you know, as you go and you teach, what has been, you're very successful, you go on, you know, Larry King, you know, you, you have programs with Steve Wozniak. What's been a low point in business for you? Um, the lowest point probably in my business occurred when I was 20, eight going on 29 um, yeah it's 28 and I right at 29 actually and what happened was I the lady next door to my office uh, was going out of going bankrupt and they had a little boutique store and they weren't making it so they came over to my office I had a little 970 square foot office at the time and I'd just been in practice for about nine months and um, this lady came over and said, is there any way you would like to take this space? Because otherwise, we're going to go bankrupt. If, we, if you could take this space and take over the prices and everything else, you could save us from doing it. And they were friends, so I said, absolutely, done it. I want to expand anyway. And I wasn't going to be able to expand because of your space, but now I can, so thank you. So I expanded it. And while I was doing it, I was constructing. And as you know, construction can be sometimes crazy. Took longer, dusty, noise, all kinds of stuff. During that time, I also... So I was going through construction, I was uh, hiring new people, I was getting new equipment, new furniture, uh, I ended up getting married, a new house, a new BMW, uh, two rings, uh, inherited a son, um, finding out that the, right after the day after our marriage we were getting pregnant within weeks, wow. Um, wow. and um, my business nosedived about God, 40%. And, and we were going on a honeymoon, and, and I didn't want to come back. I wanted to go back and live in a tent. <laughs> and I was really having a, a, a stressful moment. And I, I think I had uh, you know ulcers in my mouth. My eyes were red. I was getting dry skin. I was really super stressed. Everything was hitting at once. Oh, and I got an IRS audit because an accountant showed a $70,000 loan as a $70,000 income by accident. So it was just it was a whole bunch of stuff came in, and I went to see my dad, and um, I told him, you know, he said, "Son, you look stressed." I said, "Dad, you have no idea." And I listed all these things, you know, pity wants a party, and I just shared all this stuff. And uh, he looked at me with a smile on his face, and I was like, you know, I just told you all my stress. How come you're smiling? He said, "Son, those aren't stressings; those are blessings." 
I said, what do you mean? He said, you just have a bigger house than your mother and I have had after 30 years of being married. You have a big, brand new house that's bigger than the house we live in. You have landscaped it. It took us two years to begin to landscape our house. You have two diamond rings. I wasn't able to buy your mom a diamond ring until the 25th anniversary. Uh, you obviously paid taxes because you made friggin' money. You profited. You're expanding your office. You got new people. You're employing people. You have a child. You have a brand new BMW. I didn't even have a car for the first four years of our marriage. I had to take a bus. Uh, you went to Hawaii. We didn't even go on a vacation until our 25th anniversary. We went to Mexico. And he went on and on and on and talked about how everything that was my stressing was his dream. Mm. And when I heard that, I cried with him. I gave him a big hug and I said, thanks. The moment I got focused on serving people, I'm telling you, the next three months, my, my business went nuts. And uh, that was a great turning point. But I tell you, that was a really stressful point when there's no business and you're focused on your own self and the universe keeps patience away when you're focused on yourself. You've got to be focused on them to grow a business. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing that. What has been, you know, going from that low point, what's been a proud accomplishment that you're amazed that you were able to, to do? I think the, the, the thing that I'm most grateful for and inspired by is uh, getting this Martini method around the world and now the values application, the values determination and application. Um, some really cool stuff's happening with that. Uh, some, I mean, I can't even tell you what's happening around the world with that. The values application is, is application, like uh, I just got contacted, I just did a talk to 160 teachers yesterday. South Africa has given me the entire country to teach for teachers and to implement the um, values determination and values application method in teaching systems in South Africa. So they've just done it because they found that the kids in these rural areas that don't have hardly anything uh, went from 27 percent passing matric, which is high school, to 97 when they started implementing it, wow. which is unbelievable difference, which helps the economy and helps everything here. So th that, that accomplishment and getting that across the world into different countries and into the educational systems is one of my goals. That is one that inspires me. And getting the Demartini method into all the industries, uh, those are two things that brings tears to my eyes at night of gratitude. And, and just then the third is just, you know, having, I'm, I'm blessed to still have the vitality and energy. I'm 60 this year, and to have the vitality and energy to continue to do 400 speeches a year around the world. I, I'm very grateful. I don't know how you do it. Yeah, I, people always say, well, you, know, you don't look your age. Um, but you know what? Uh, when you're doing what you love and love it, what you do, you don't seem to have time and space in your mind. You just keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And Dr. Martini, who are some of your mentors and some of their best advice for you? Well, you know, I, uh, their, their first mentor I probably had, besides my parents, uh, was Howard Hughes. Uh, when I was 14, hitchhiking to California. I ran into him in El Paso, Texas, and he saw me getting, uh, uh, you know, confronted by three cowboys that were going to beat me up. He saw me, and I didn't know what to do, and so I barked and he'd screamed and yelled at these guys and freaked them out. And he saw me on the corner, and he started laughing. And he came up to me, put his hand on my, sh on my shoulder, and he walked me over to a little malt shop and bought me a Coca-Cola. And um, then he said, are you done? And I said, yeah. And he says, then come with me. And he took me to a library. And he uh, sat me down with two books at a table. And he said, son, I want to teach you two things. You've got to promise you'll never forget this. He said, number one is never judge a book by its cover because it'll fool you. He says, I bet you think I'm just some ordinary guy, but I'm actually one of the wealthiest men in the world. I have everything that money can buy, ships, planes, boats, I mean, every, I've got everything. He said, but, so don't ever judge the books by a cover because it'll fool you. And number two is, you learn how to read. And he said, he put my hands on the two books, Aristotle and Plato. He said, you learn how to read, boy, because there's only two things they can never take away from you, and that is your love and wisdom. So you gain the wisdom of love and the love of wisdom. Well, everything I do today, the concourse of wisdom and love is the foundation of everything I do. So that had an impact on me. <clears throat> then Paul Bragg, when I was 17, the guy that actually inspired me that night, he had a major impact on me because I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for meeting him that night. And his daughter is still a friend of mine and I still interact with her. She's 85 and she's a dynamo traveling the world like I do. And then I met a, a guy named Lakish Waram, who is a mystic who uh, had six PhDs by age 35 that uh, introduced me to the study of mysteries and um, that, that has been very, very meaningful to depth 
to add depth into my life, to study philosophies, religions, and science of the world. And then there was Jim Parker, who impacted me in the chiropractic practice, and D.A. McPherson, who showed me how to see, you know, a lot of patients and efficiently, uh, very efficiently. And then I've been studying the great, I've studied every Nobel Prize winner, every great philosopher I've given my hands on, every great uh, politician, leader, celebrity, um, every great financier, business leader. I just study their lives and read about them. So I have thousands of mentors along the way. Yeah. And then I own the traits of them to try to recognize that whatever I see in them, I have. So I can stand on their shoulders and now get to hang out with many of them. Who have you been able to meet that you remember reading or listening to them and thinking, one day I want to meet this person? Well, when I was uh, 23, uh, I wrote a list of 50 people I wanted to meet. <clears throat> and it was like Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Julia Roberts, you know, these kind of people. Mm -hmm. Celebrities and things. And I've, I've knocked it out. I got all 50. Wow. In fact, I, I, 900 people that I've met that I've I kept adding to that list. I've hit 900 people now. And I, uh, I, just serendipitous things were occurring. I mean, I'd be a restaurant, there they are. Or I'd be on a flight, there they are. Or I was on a corner one time, and I met Sylvester Sloan at a corner on Sunset Boulevard. Happened to be on a corner, and he pulled up in his, uh, his Mercedes, and I reached down, and we started chatting while he was waiting at a light. That's how I met him. <laughs> uh, to actually getting consulting, and I get to consult with some of these people that I once had as mentors. So uh, there's lots and lots of people over the years. It's but I started with 50, and then once I reached those, I just kept going. Yeah, and obviously you are super productive. You fill your day. You jam pack it. What are some of your daily rituals that you find most important that we should be doing? You know, every morning. Uh, hold on a second. Every morning I. Uh, I don't get out of bed until I have a, my gratitudes, and I uh, pull them out here. Every morning I do my gratitudes, and I go through and think about what I'm grateful for um, from the day before, uh, and what I have on my plate today that I'm grateful get an opportunity to do, and uh, including this. And then um, I don't get out of bed. I try not to get out of bed until I get a tear of gratitude, because I call that the window washer of the mind, and allow the mind to be clear. And then I get up and I'll sometimes write there on the spot, sometimes I'll do it in my head, most of the time I'll write on a little piece of paper, and, um, but it's, it's a basically the highest priority action steps I can do that day to help my fulfill my mission. And that's on top of the normal agenda that I get from my publicist or my directors or whatever. And, um, and I go for that. And then I will usually get some stretching and kind of some yoga stuff and some calisthenics. I'll uh, shower, I'll have my uh, fresh grapes or fresh fruit, my yogurt or cottage cheese, and my multi-grain bread uh, toast in the morning, and then I'll get on with it. And I'll be starting to do interviews, or I'll speak, or I'll I'll research, or I'll be traveling, whatever it is that I'm to do. It's research, write, travel, teach. And then um, at lunch, I eat usually salad, soup, sandwich, sushi, uh, simple stuff. And the same for dinner. The tonight I had salmon, uh, steamed salmon, carrots, and spinach, and multi-grain toast. And um, and then I do the a list. I, I have a list of things that I'm grateful for. I don't know if you can see it here, but I keep a, a list of gratitudes every single day. There's volumes of these. So is there pictures in there, or what is that? Those are pictures of uh, things I'm like when I spoke the other day. We had about about five thousand people there, and so I get pictures of that speaking, meeting Steve Wozniak, these kind of things. But I keep record of everything I get to do that I'm grateful for. Wow. I mean, everything. It's all there, including the, the trip to Tehran. Uh, I was in the Canary Islands Christmas, and I was Madeira and, you know, Casablanca, wherever I go. And then, and I just keep volumes of this. Wow. So I, I have just everything that I'm shooting for, all my goals, all my objectives, my posthumous biography, um, all my gratitudes. I have volumes and volumes of these things. Because I figure that I, I was told when I was I was born on Thanksgiving Day. My mom said that when I was four, if you count your blessings and are grateful for what you got, you get more to be grateful for. So I've been doing that, and I tell you that uh, I got the largest collection of gratitudes of anybody I've ever met on that, Earth. That looks like just one of those looks like a, like yeah. a huge volume. Yeah, there's thousands of them. It's just I mean, I'll average maybe ten or more a day, maybe sometimes fifteen a day wow. of gratitudes, wow. and I, I keep record of that. I document. I figured this is a, a journal of my life, of all the gratitudes in my life, which I think is a great piece. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, I have one last question for you, and I appreciate you taking the time. You obviously have a jam-packed schedule. Um, before I ask it, I want you to tell people where they can reach out to you to thank you. Where can they find out more about your, your methods, your products, your courses, and what you have going on uh, as of now? Well, the fastest and easiest way to get a hold of me is probably uh, go to drdmartini.com, drdmartini.com, d-r-d-e-m-a-r-t-i-n-i.com. Um, on there is, uh, gosh, all the radio shows, well, not all, but hundreds of radio shows, television shows, newspapers, magazines, articles, writings, inspired writings. It's just an educational experience. And it has a list also of, of uh, what's happening, all the events that are going on around the world. It has a, um, all the, the products that I have around the world, uh, all the things that I'm about to do. It's got educate. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's filled with stuff. And so that's probably the best place. Or they can contact my office, one eight 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 Demartini, Or they could go on uh, Facebook and get my Yeah, experience. Facebook, you have a very, there's over 100,000 fans, and they're very active on there. Yeah, we, we, uh, we have, we, we've got a pretty good thing. We just started the Facebook. That's not been but a few years, so we oh, just wow. started it. Oh. And, it. And it's growing. So we're growing about maybe, I think about 6,000, 7,000 a month going in there. And so... Um, it's growing, but you know, I just, I just, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Yeah. Uh, now I'm yeah. not, I don't even have a cell phone. I don't even use a cell phone. My daughter bought me one, and I only used it for if my limo doesn't show up or something. But I don't use cell phones. I stay out of that the network. But what I do is I, I, uh, so I can research, write, travel, teach, because I, I don't, I, I like to be able to have my freedom to do what I'm inspired by. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Timothy, my last question is this: Obviously, your life's mission is to be a teacher and to spread your message. What is a student that sticks out in your mind that you're in awe that you were able to help them accomplish? Well, one, one uh, student that inspires me, but I can't say that it's just because of me, but I can say that I'm inspired to have him as a student. Mm -hmm. He's done some extraordinary things. Uh, was an eight-year-old boy that I met a few years ago who's now 12 who has, I don't know, but I think he's up to 20,000 books he's read now, and he, um, he's, a, he's a, amazing. I, I took him to the Institute of Advanced Studies, and we had a four-and-a-half-hour meeting. We met there, because his, his parents took him there, flew him there. We went to the Institute of Advanced Studies to meet Freeman Dyson, who took over at Albert Einstein's position, and we had this four-and-a-half-hour discussion on astrophysics, uh, string theory, biology, um, cosmology, theology, for four and a half hours and we kind of taped it between this eight-year-old, this 86-year-old at the time, he's 90 now uh, almost, and myself. And that seeing him bloom and do amazing things, I've been able to help him immensely because he was completely an autistic child when we started. Now he's got a foundation, he's doing amazing things, his parents are working with him. He's just an amazing boy. His name is Ahmed and uh, it's truly extraordinary. But he's one. Then there was a guy that had a speech and, and visual impairments um, when I was in chiropractic college that I taught speed reading to, which was difficult. We never thought, he never thought he would be able to ever read. He became a scholar, travels all over the world and lectures today as a doctor. Uh, that's inspiring to me. And there's just so many people that, I mean, I got stories after stories of people that I've been blessed to, it just brings tears to my eyes, the things that, that people change. Yeah. I mean, I had a, a woman that was raped by a hundred men for three and a half days by a motorcycle gang and was tied to a block and, and I uh, with a camera crew of four people on a television station did a live intervention with the Demartini method and actually helped her dissolve all the fears, all that anger, all the hurt, all the stuff that was in her life and come out on the thing where she's actually grateful for that event and now she travels around the world empowering women. So I mean I've seen some amazing stuff and I'm very blessed to uh, watch transformations every week so I think I got the best life on the planet yeah well I just want to be the first one to thank you thank you for the, taking the time I got a lot of it I'm sure the audience will too and I really appreciate it Dr. Martini. thank you I appreciate the opportunity to share